Uh, welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's great to have a chance to have people in the same room. This is the first time we're doing this in person. So um, yeah, the town halls through COVID were all online and co uh, Zoomed. So anyways, I hope to be able to continue this format going forward. The idea is that we do at least a couple of these a year and um, go to different places in the community. So with that, um, there are a couple of housekeeping items. We're here in person, but we continue to welcome residents on Zoom. Um, some people are online tonight. This meeting is being recorded. So um, if all the quality of the sound and everything works out well, it will be posted online like the regular council meeting is. Now, as far as questions, I'm going to try and cover off any um, quick questions and clarifications as we go through. If there's anything on a slide, of course, we'll want to make sure that uh, we ask and answer those things right away as we go along. Um, but any topics that you want to bring up, maybe that we're not touching on here or whatever, at the end, we'll have time to go through questions. Some people have already written and said, could you talk about this or submitted um, you know, different topics. That, so I've got some answers already on things, but if there's something missing that you wanted to raise, then we'll do that at the end. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, there are a few ways to ask a question, make a comment. Uh, you will see options along the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen, depending on whether you're using a laptop or an iPad. Um, it's best if you use the Q&A, the question and answer function on your, um, on your laptop or your, your, um, your electronic device. And there are two speech bubbles. If you would click on the two speech bubbles, uh, that will bring up the Q&A function. The pop-up window comes up and you just type your question in there. Uh, the chat is another option, but it doesn't work as well because um, the coordinator here is having to look for these things and it doesn't show up the same way and it could disappear if there's a lot of conversation happening. So if you can't use the Q&A, um, Heather will try and look, but at the same time, it's best to stay away from the chat. So in any case, I think that's everything. Um, that was, where's page two? Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, I do wanna respect everyone's time. So when you're asking questions, either online or here, uh, let's be brief and stick to the point if we can. And um, your reviews. Basically three categories of conversation, an update on what's been happening, what's been done, I uh, want to highlight some of the things that staff is working on now. That's uh, what's in the works part. And then there are other highlights and good news stories that I want to share. And then we'll get to the questions. So as far as, come on in. Um, as far as what we've done, this will be on the slide that talks about the customer review and modernization. Thank you. Um, the customer service review is um, one of the big research pieces that uh, was completed. Some of you will remember this. I highlighted it in my last um, meeting because uh, we received grant funding for this and the other three projects that I want to highlight to you. So um, the focus of the customer service review is really about customer relationship management. It's called CRM. So I'm going to use CRM to refer to it because it's shorter. CRM relies on various tools and techniques, techniques as well as technology. And basically the goal here is to build better relationships and communications with customers. It's used in business, not only the municipal world. So in our case, in the municipal world, um, we interact with all kinds of people. We talk to residents and home builders and developers. Uh, we have various suppliers and service providers, uh, even other levels of gov government. So a good CRM system uh, helps that helps you understand how things are going. You collect data about how you serve people, how you interact with them. And if you get good data and trustworthy uh, results and reporting, then you can actually try and improve your processes. So um, the, the processes can be streamlined so that they improve customer service, either because you can make them more consistent and make sure that you have standards of service for your residents um, and then if it's consistent, then you know that you'll have a good experience each time. The other thing is uh, a lot of times, the kinds of questions people have are time sensitive. You want a building permit, you want to get started, then you need to know that these processes will work and that the timelines can be met. So customer service then with consistency and timeliness improved means better customer service. The other part of it, of course, is money. Um, like companies that work for profit, 
they they look at the bottom line but in the municipal sector we look at money all the time council members number one job is to be um a steward of, of finance for the, the people who pay the taxes in our communities so we want to make sure that we're getting the best value for every dollar spent um the other part of CRM is that, of course, like everything, um, increasingly some processes are automated and then people can get information quickly or they can um, get consistent uh, messaging on a particular topic. So that's a part of the process when you're trying to prove is what will you automate and how will you make things work um, consistently for everyone at any time of the day or night you're accessing um, information from, oh, I don't know, about what time, ice is available, those kinds of things. Um, the other benefit of this whole process, uh, the CRM process, is that when staff has good information, they can work together. So to the extent that people at the front desk are helping people with answers uh, to questions, if the information is all in one place, and let's say the building, the chief building official has updated new data about building codes or something, then the quality of the interaction is helped because the messaging and the collaboration and everything is the same for everyone it's consistent it's in one place and it can be updated really easily so basically that that whole way of thinking was used to understand how we're doing in our office um, the project reviewed the current state of our customer delivery uh, based on the findings uh, we were um, told about how what kinds of cost savings we could uh, get by improving some of our processes also, out of this uh, uh, this research, we got information about uh, how to update our policies and procedures, and ultimately, that all that information was used to update um, the new customer service policy. So, everyone's always trying to improve at the office. This is another way that um, staff is going to focus on making sure the services um, are delivered consistently and well. Now, the other, the, the second project is the organizational review an organizational review organizational review in this case is not about customer service it's about how does our staff um, work together what are the reporting lines how many departments are there so it's a look at the organization itself um, steady growth we've seen that in our community and as, as the community grows we're going to need uh, to hire people to do different kinds of work more of them in different kinds of roles um, we want to make sure that, for example, recreational spaces are maintained for people when they come in or ice is ready or parks are um, expanded to make sure that as more children move in, there is room to play soccer and baseball, those kinds of things. Um, in public works and engineering, there's, there are the crews that will be grading some roads and, and then the winter plowing. So as the community grows, as there are more roads or parks, Everything has to proportionally increase as we're going along. So that's what the organizational review was tasked to do. What did the report say? It said that um, we're doing a pretty good job here. Uh, the organizational structure is compared to peers across Ontario. So or, uh, communities like ours, Middlesex centrist population and geography are considered. Comparisons are made between other co uh, communities that have the same kind of land mass and population and geographic dispersion, those kinds of things. So um, there were really only two things that stuck out that might might be improved in the shorter term. Uh, one was that our corporate services staffing was um, highlighted as being below average relative to the peers in terms of staffing. And the second point that was suggested or highlighted was that we might have some refinement in the structure. But the key points indicated that Middlesex Centre is really well positioned for growth. Uh, they considered the span of control and as well as how many layers do we have. So we're, we're there. We have got the right number of uh, departments with appropriate staff. Also in line with the peers um, from the services and standards perspective, we were um, well positioned and Actually, we're a little below average in terms of the number of dollars that are spent, workforce dollars per household in the community. So um, that was very comforting to know. In summary, then relative to our peers, we can provide services at the same level as they can. We are somewhat less expensive than they are. That, that was good news. 
And the improvements are the kind that staff can obviously manage and um, uh, plan for effectively. And the third plan is the fire master plan. Um, like the whole environment around us, the environment in which our fire services um, team works has been changing. Um, managing budget, of course, has been key. And as I mentioned, um, the growth has meant changes in activity. There's a 10% uh, increase in call volumes uh, between the last time they were um, doing the planning, like year over year. And that obviously affects HR management. We have a paid on call volunteer fire force. And to the extent that um, there's increase in demand for their service, um, it's a challenge to make sure that there are the right number of people on staff and available when there's a need for them, whether it's an accident on a highway or whether it's a fire in the kitchen. So um, this is something that the uh, staff have to look at, the management team, and make sure that all of these variables are balanced and that the service can be delivered at the standard that people expect it to be delivered. Um, the fire master plan currently covers three things. So they look at the they looked at the department profile. So they looked at all people, uh, compensation, what kinds of training uh, they get, the core services that they provide. They also looked at um, an analysis of how they perform. So they looked at things. What kinds of incidents did they respond to and how frequently did that particular kind of incident um, need protection from the fire department? And the third thing was um, they also did an assessment of what was going to be needed in the future in, in, in terms of a strategy for the next 10 years. So building blocks to make sure that not only is level of service adequate now, that it can be met as the world's changing, but also what needs to be done to build the foundations to make sure that it can continue in that way. <clears throat> now, um, the other thing that is done is the budget. Thank you. Um, so most of you will have already probably looked at it. Um, we did pass the budget in January, in mid-January. The uh, total number of dollars that we needed was 70 million. Uh, 44 million was allocated to the operating budget and 26 million for the capital projects. As always, the big capital dollars are usually associated with bridges and roads. That was the biggest item. But um, the other capital projects include water, wastewater, um, on our parks and recreation departments. So all of those um, items are there. Next slide. The implication of that dollar amount that I just mentioned is that the budget was increased. I mean, pardon me, the, the tax increase was 2.5%. And that worked out to about $63 per, for a, on an assessment of a $400,000 house or $39 uh, increase based on a 1 million uh, agricultural uh, assessment. When you're paying your taxes, um, the only 52% of the money in the budget comes from taxes. The other part comes from other sources like the municipal service or service fees and that kind of thing. So um, if you're interested in getting more details on this, then you would uh, you can go online and look at the budget. They've done a really great job of presenting a budget document. They got an award for the work that they did last year, the staff did, they submitted it also for this year. I expect we'll probably have another one, but um, everything is in plain English. There are graphs and charts. Um, you can look at things in bars or circles, whichever suits you. And um, it really makes sense when you work through it in order. Now, um, the next slide. The other part that some people are surprised to find out is that um, the tax bill that you get in the mail isn't just what we are charging for services here locally. This is a two-tier community, and I guess some of the newer residents maybe come from um, urban centers, and they're not always aware that we are more multi-tier uh, community. So our tax bill here in Middlesex Center includes not only our municipal levy, but it count as well that includes the county level and, of course, education. Um, and what does the county pay for? There's a whole lot of service that we get here in our area that is... Um, better managed at another level. For example, libraries. Libraries are, um, to, to run our own library would be really hard because it is expensive to buy books and, and to have staff and build the, the buildings. 
So when it's managed at the county level, um, for those of you who use the library will know that books go from one branch to another branch. Um, they are able to provide programming. There are different uh, sizes and types of libraries depending on the geography. So um, some libraries have meet more meeting rooms and things like that because they're farther out in the rural area. And um, so they're tailored to what the community needs. But this is a really good way of um, maximizing bang for the buck for our residents. Um, Strathmere Lodge is something that surprises people sometimes, but that is mandated under legislation. Uh, so our county facility is Strathmere, and it's in Strathroy Care Dock, but that is supported by everyone in the county. Okay, now, next slide. That's it for the recap. Um, this is where it gets more exciting. Uh, what are we working on? Okay. Um, one of the things that's um, been increasingly obvious is that we've outgrown our space. And uh, look forward, obviously, because everything, you build a foundation and then you build on that and you build on that. So the office has been good for almost half a century, but um, now that we've got um, different ways of working and we've got teams that have grown, some teams are not located together. It's not as effective and efficient to work that way. So um, staff undertook a review of the facility and the result is that we've decided that it's best to move forward by renovating the property that we have there. Um, again, um, the work will be starting this year, hopefully in September. And it, what it includes is an expansion and a renovation of the existing office areas to uh, accommodate and co-locate co all the teams that need to work together, and also to expand certain storage areas. For example, um, municipal governments are required to have all kinds of records. So those need a place to be stored in proper conditions. Um, council chambers have been challenging for quite some time. Um, I think some of you may have been at a drainage meeting or planning meetings, and to the extent that there are more than sort of 20 people in the old chambers, um, there has to be space to accommodate the public. Um, some of you will have attended meetings in the community hall, which has been treated as sort of an overflow area. So that has been working fairly well, but it's best to have the chambers set up so that things like Zoom, um, speakers and all those things are working properly all the time without having to worry about setup. Um, the other part of it is that we need to make sure that our buildings are compliant with um, accessibility legislation. And uh, those renovations need to happen to make sure our, our buildings are up to speed. The other thing, of course, that a lot of you who've lived here a long time will know is that a lot of the work that um, is done with respect to buildings and facilities uh, incorporates green aspects um, like the, this building with the heat taken out of the water to make ice is used to heat the floors and the water in the change rooms. So that kind of um, improvement is also being considered to the extent that it's feasible and that um, it will enhance, enhance our operational efficiency and effectiveness. Next slide. This is just a rendering of what it might look like. It could change over time. The idea is that the chambers would be on, so in this picture, the, the chambers would be on your left and the Goldstream Community Hall is the part with this peaked roof at the back. And then the um, expansion for the offices is the other sort of L part that comes out from the um, front of the old building. Um, it could change. This is one of the sketches that was presented and I think we're kind of working with it, but it's probably not perfect. So I just want to warn you in case you say, well, it's going to be like this, kind of, sort of, probably, but it may be amended a bit. Um, so originally, too, the plan was that we would all be working in the building, but in areas that were under construction. Because of health and safety reasons, the um, staff decided that it's best if everyone gets out. And while it's under construction, there will be um, no one working in the office and the Coldstream Hall will be closed for recreational purposes as well. So um, just to be clear, those are all temporary. Everybody will be back in the building. Um, the recreational activities will commence again after the building is done. Uh, the hope is that we're going to start working on this in September and to the extent that it takes 12 to 15 months, 
I would think that it'd be great if we would be opening our 2025 council with a meeting in the chamber. So that would be the goal. Next one. And of course, what's the cost? Um, the project is going to cost five, about 5.7 million, but it won't have a tax impact um, on residents because um, the, the funding is coming from the various departments and the budgets, uh, the reserves they have in the budgets as they relate to them. So those are the amounts there. And again, I just say it's temporary closure. We're not going to be um, closed forever there. Things will open up as soon as possible. Okay, development. <laughs> okay, good. Um, development and zoning and all those things um, are a topic of interest to so many people right now, not just to, because of the changes that are rolling out from the government starting in August last uh, summer, uh, but also because we've just finished our, um, our official plan amendments, which are not ex um, approved yet by the county or the province, but um, this is a timely topic. So. The proposed provincial uh, policy uh, planning statement that the government has just recently put forth, um, it, it includes things like um, enabling up to three additional units, uh, dwelling units, both in urban and rural um, homes. Um, things like garden suites and, and um, oh, say the, what else? I'm just thinking, the, 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 a lot of the calls you get are about additional units or space for people, so that's in my mind right now. But um, that isn't all finalized yet, even at the provincial level. They're still accepting comments on the proposed legislation, so that will be um, coming down the pipeline. And we're all waiting for that because people have questions and we're not really quite sure exactly how things will fall out yet. Um, the rate of change in terms of buildings um, and development in the area is something that people have really noticed. According to MPAC, our community, uh, Middlesex Centre, was one of the fastest growing uh, communities in southwestern Ontario. Our, our building department issued more building permits than any other. Now, those are, all, are not for houses. All of them are not for houses. Some of them would be for swimming pools and for um, uh, garden sheds or additions. So, but as the volume in most communities changes between things, we had a lot of houses and a lot of building permits issues for those over the last number of years. Um, the other thing that people talk about is the variety and the kinds of housing that is um, coming. So um, when I think about examples here, we've had more high density housing coming online. Uh, in Ilderton, Goldleaf has just started, um, or they're building uh, seniors' homes. They're kind of one floor and the area is, um, the the, the design of the landscaping and everything takes into account the population that will be living there. So they don't have sidewalks, but there are no curbs. The grass goes right down to the pavement. And when you talk to the people who live in these, they, they say that, well, they, they, the snow is removed early in the morning. And if you wanna go for a walk, then you can walk on any street. So these are like, um, they're not gated communities, but they're not high traffic areas. And everyone feels safe and can enjoy their lifestyle in that area that is designed especially for them. Also here um, behind the, the, uh, the back wall here, um, the groundwork is being prepared for the design for happiness bill. And that the first phase will include um, uh, higher density housing, but ultimately this back corner here was designated for an apartment style building. And even as today, there are questions about what's happening with apartments in our community. Um, there are a number of sites that have identified that they'd like to place higher uh, buildings. Most of them, I think, were about four. I think that one was five. But in any case, the thought is that we need to have uh, diversity, diversity, diversity in the kinds of housing we have in our community and options for everyone at different age group and also provide different price points for people so that young couples starting out have somewhere to go or people who want to get out of their house and just be able to turn the key and go the way to the south for the winter, have all those choices and options. Um, oh, I think that's everything there. Um, the next slide is about transportation and um, service master plans. Um, this, this work is being done in conjunction with um, our completed official plan, 
the one that's still got to be approved, but you have to look forward. So we're starting uh, work to make sure that the transportation master plan is undertaken and completed and the servicing master plan is done. These are both really long-term plans, uh, 20 to 25 years out, and uh, they will provide a framework for where will roads be? What kind of roads do we need? Where do the pipes go? For water, wastewater, stormwater management. All of those things have to be thought out in advance. It takes time and money to build them. So you need to know where you're going and why and how it's going to fit in with what's planned for each of the areas. Um, transportation master plan isn't just about cars. Um, some of you have been here quite a while and you'll know that we have the cycling pieces in place and trails uh, map on our master recreation plan. All of these things have to work together because people want to be able to walk to the store or the library. They want to make sure they get exercise. They've got pets. They want to know that their kids will be safe if they want to ride on a bike path. So all of these things are, it's integrative and it takes into account all the populations, all the people who have different needs and um, it's, it's meant to design a community that is well-serviced and meets the needs of the residents. Um, both public, and um, the initial public uh, meetings and information sessions for the transportation servicing plan and um, transportation and servicing plan were held in January, but there will be another round of meetings coming up and we'll, they'll be scheduled probably in uh, June. Again, if you want to attend these, then check the um, municipal website. All the details, dates, and time times for those things always published there. Okay, and finally, yes. Many of you will know that it's 25 years since this municipality was created. Um, the original Delaware, Lobo, and London townships uh, amalgamated and the Middlesex Center was started out then. Um, over the years, we've grown from about 13 and a half thousand people to um, or just around 20,000. And a lot of change has happened and a lot of progress has been made in a lot of ways. And the anniversary presents a really good opportunity for um, the community to come together and celebrate all of those people who have done great things for our community, the volunteers and projects, and who also continue to do that for our community. So you'll see that the the diagram is not completely filled in. Um, this is a work in process and staff are all trying to um, plan the, the events and uh, contact all the proper service clubs and partner organizations. The dates and details will be added. Um, oh, and well, for example, there's a banner there. Uh, there's one in Ilderton and one here. So they've started kind of putting the word out that it is an anniversary year and we're going to be doing something. So. I hope that over the summer, um, you can see a lot of the dates are warm weather months. I hope that um, at least one or two of these events will fit in your calendar and we'll be able to join you um, in celebrating. Again, uh, check the social media, our Middlesex Center webpage, and all of the details will be there as well. Okay, number 13, I guess. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things too that um, we're proud of and what people have done, um, on, what people on staff have done. Um, this building is now a uh, Hanson Foundation certified uh, accessible building. Um, the award hasn't been presented or the certificate hasn't been presented yet, but um, we know that it is something that they've accomplished already. So it's safe to say that we're getting this award. Um, what it means is that the organization came in and looked at things like elevators or hallways or uh, washrooms and lighting and access. And that this is a building that people can come to and uh, know that they'll be able to get around and it's, it's user-friendly for everyone. So that was a great accomplishment. Um, as far as recreational programming, over the last um, say 12 months or so, um, there's a youth advisory committee and different um, sports and activities have become very popular. We now have a person uh, who works here at the Wellness Center who's part of their, their role is to help design community programming. So there have been um, classes on how to play pickleball offered. Uh, in Ilderton, there's uh, youth programming at the uh, uh, community, uh, at the, the rooms above the curling club in the uh, arena. And uh, what else is there? Oh, Tai Chi, um, various exercise groups. 
So this is something people have been asking for and they would like to be involved more in athletic and recreational things. So some of these are pilots um, and some of them are obviously taking off. So they're going to be continued for sure. But as our community grows, this is a change that's had um, um, impact for people when you can offer a service or a recreational activity that is uh, interesting, meaningful. So if you have ideas too, speak to staff because uh, People are surveyed regularly. I know uh, we we conduct quick surveys on Facebook or on online, but there are also bigger ones. But um, the communication piece is really important and it helps staff know which way to go, what's working and what's not. So keep an eye out for those. And next, uh, grant opportunities. Again, if you've attended one of these, usually I can highlight that we've applied for certain things. Um, sometimes I have dollars to, uh, to tell you about, but right now um, there's a whole bunch of um, opportunity there. We're keeping our fingers crossed. I do want to highlight the Elderton one, which is the Green and Inclusive Community Buildings Grant. Um, staff did apply to this in 2021, and we just recently, before Christmas, found out that we did not get that funding. It was a submission for a new arena for Ilderton. And um, since that isn't happening, uh, a second intake just recently opened up. Staff put in another application. They revised it completely. And the new submission is for a smaller amount. And the goal here is to refurbish Ilderton Arena. It'd be for about $3 million. And included in this request is um, money then for um, all the mechanical pieces so that the ice and all of those um, activities that require refrigeration and so forth can continue. And also um, accessibility in the foyer, foyer area um, is part of the revamp too. So the, the building is old, it's half a century, and it isn't up to par and doesn't meet the needs of all of the people in our community. So hopefully, um, $3 million will come through and that work can be undertaken. As I said, um, it's a different tack. The idea is that if this building can get an upgrade for about $3 million, we can probably make it last another decade, 15 years probably. So that would mean that the people in who live in Ilderton are able to then um, enjoy the activities in their whole community as well. So I think this is something about third time's a charm. So fingers crossed. Um, oh, and the other part was this, this is a really interesting one too, that's a national science um, research kind of uh, funding grant. Um, that project is funded for 1.5 million and um, it's really great to have the municipality have the opportunity to participate in that because we'll have benefit from the learnings of that. So I don't have anything real to report on that yet. I don't, I'm not sure how far along it is, but um, lots of interesting stuff is happening there. Okay, other news, um, yeah, the Enviro, uh, the Enviro Depot is open, not last Saturday, but the Saturday before that, and um, there's just a, uh, a little thank you there at the bottom to uh, acknowledge the sponsors of the uh, ice skating over the March break, so I say there's lots of good stuff happening in the community. Now, moving on to the next slide. We have um, the first of the questions, right? Yeah. So these are some of the questions that people um, sent along when they were registering for the, the meeting tonight. The first one is about sidewalks. So that's the next slide. Yeah. Just pause for, for one moment. Pause, yeah. Um, members on watching online and having a hard time seeing the screen and unfortunately I can't make it full screen. I'm just gonna try to move the yeah. record a bit. So yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. New technology here. Mm -hmm. Bear with us so we can get a little bit here. To the end with that cable. And I think we can go a little bit. No, that should be one of the as we can do it. It's the reflection, so I'm not sure it's helpful. Okay. Okay, so this was a question about um, every year there's a project to, uh, to upgrade or install new sidewalks. So last year, uh, sidewalks in Ilderton were uh, on, the, on the list. This year, the projects are scheduled in Delaware. 
They're along Mill Creek and uh, York Street, Osborne and Atkinson Court. And the work is going to start. The work is going to start in uh, May and end early in June. Um, so every year this money comes out of the capital budget and it's tied into the strategic plan when people were being interviewed for strategic plan and people who participate in the recreational and um, those other studies. Um, making our communities walkable and allowing people to get out and about and accessible. This is part of our, um, this is something that everybody wants. It is a change for some people who really don't want a sidewalk in front of their house, but having an integrated pathway so you can walk to the grocery store or kids can get to the school or whatever, that is something that we're working on. It'll take some time, but over time, we will have connect, connected networks so people can get where they want to go. Um, I did have um, a question that came in between uh, this question, and the question was, is there a foreseeable date for installing sidewalks on Tungsley Line and Railway Ave in Kamoka? So same, same answer, kind of. Yes, they will come, but it will be tied to the development that's taking place in the area and when we are planning uh, sidewalks in Kamoka. So I'm not sure what the timetable is. It might be next year or the year after, but every year there's a chunk of money allocated to fixing those up and making sure the connections are there. Um, next one. There was a question. Um, that talked about the five corners and Coldstream Road alignments and all, all of the um, work that's going to happen there. So this summer, all of the preliminary work will be um, done. So they have to do locates and measure things and so on and so forth. Um, all the utilities will be identified and all that will be prepped. And then next summer is when they will start the actual road work on that project. Um, there's a link there if you're interested in details. It's accessible. Uh, online and you can look at more there. The next slide deals with the question I had was, will new zoning bylaw increase or decrease the rate of loss of farmland? And um, so this is a provincial versus a Middlesex Center uh, zoning bylaw kind of thing. The provincial policy statement will have an impact on farming um, farmland and where farming happens, not our zoning bylaws. So the zoning bylaw is geared to a specific um, land use, whereas the guide, guidelines from the province have an overarching kind of um, uh, policy uh, relating to how land is used. So that isn't something that we can actually uh, control. We can control the zoning bylaws pieces, but not the provincial policy statement. There was also a question about um, intensifying or providing a greater variety of housing and so on. And um, the, the question I have is, with regards to types of housing, the London and St. Thomas Association of Realtors reported the average home price in Middlesex Centre to be $1.364 million in October 2022, with a composite MLS home price index at $828,000. In council on the 20 uh, in January of 2023, a home price beyond $572,000 was ident identified as unattainable. The design for happiness townhouses, which are the ones that are uh, scheduled for behind the building here, to be constructed in Kamoka start at $725,000 to $750,000. Where do you see affordable homes being built in Middlesex Centre? These are all really big numbers, and um, I take the writer's point, um, but the market is what decides the price of a house, unless there's a sort of a, an agreement with buildings that are refurbished in some uh, communities around here. Oh, and also in Strathroy, um, if there are floors or different, it's a formula that is figured out. And um, if there's a builder who wants to build that kind of a building and has um, allocated spaces to um, people within certain income ranges, and then the rent is geared to income. Those are completely different kinds of projects. So when you have building lands and people are building things on them, they build and the price is determined then by whatever the market is willing to pay or what it can bear. So it doesn't really address at all the housing uh, needs and affordability. 
So I hope that answers that question. It's, it's a really complex pardon. Uh, actually, I just got an email. Uh, Minister Clark is going to be in London tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. And um, the, the topic of conversation will be um, housing and homelessness. So it is definitely something that you hear a lot about. Um, but I think it'll be a while before we have some really concrete plans and how all that's going to move forward. So it's a work in process. Thank you. Um, so there are new provincial rules on severing land from existing age bridge, what is now allowable in our area. So with respect to Middlesex Center and farms, um, there is no change. If you have a farm property, the minimum is severed and the remaining pieces, there are rules about that. So um, that, that isn't changing. What has changed, and I mentioned this earlier, are that additional residential units will be allowed um, on farm properties. So if you have um, family that wants to move to the farm, um, you can create an additional housing unit for them, like the kids are going to come move back in. Or alternatively, if a farmer wants to retire and wants to downsize and the family is going to move in, then it'll be possible to make sure that those housing um, needs will be accommodated for everyone. Uh, the next question was with, re with respect to taxes and cost of development in Kamoka Kilworth. How does the principle of development paying for development apply? Uh, development charges are monies that are paid when, when new projects happen, and those end up in de uh, development charges reserves. There is a rule book, a very thick rule book about how you can use those monies. Um, so if this building required an expansion because there were more houses across the road and there were lots of kids coming here and there wasn't room for ice and we would have put another third pad in, the new pieces can be paid for to accommodate new residents. You can't just build another arena and say, well, we need another. It, it, there's a formula on how you allocate those money to new homes. So if, um, if there is no development charge, that is charged, um, and I think this comes from some of the news where uh, the government was announcing that we're going to forgive or we will say developers don't need to pay development charges. That would mean that development charge money would not be collected and it wouldn't be available to cover growth related costs that residents um, would want to have covered because the growth would pay for growth. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> Um, so anyways, I, I don't really know how I can say how does it how does it pay? It doesn't. If there is nothing collected, then that fund would eventually dry up and it wouldn't be replenished with new funds from new houses. Um, the next slide is yep. The question was, can some of the three point six million dollars that Middlesex Center received uh, for the ten acres um, at the uh, behind us here, be used to renovate the Kamoka Community Centre. Um, the land, the money that was uh, paid for the DHF lands was put into a, a reserve and is allocated for other purposes. The Kamoka Community Centre thus have its own reserve fund though, and staff um, always are looking for, as I, as I mentioned earlier, grant monies to help augment that. So um, for example, if the building needs accessibility, improvements and that money um, can come from the Kamoka Wellness, I mean, pardon me, the Kamoka Community Center uh, funds, not from the wellness lands. And uh, there's a question about funds coming, um, where would funds come to pay for the replacement of the fence between the CPR and the homes on Union Ave, that would be on the north side of Union Ave towards the tracks there. And the answer is that the municipality is paying for the cost of the attenuation fence and any future upkeep is going to be borne by residents. All right. And I think that was the last slide. Yeah. <laughs> so questions, comments, um, clarifications on anything that, or th topics that people didn't ask about. Is there something <clears throat> people want to have addressed? Yes, please. If it's open for questions from the floor. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Jim St. John's floor today without present, if you need that for, uh, for the record. Okay. Um, my apologies, I was a couple minutes late coming in, but um, we were talking about a customer service review. And um, the, the 
incrementally defined there was to evaluate the timing and timeliness of responses. Um, is there also going to be a what I'm going to call an evaluation of uh, the quality of the responses? In other words, if somebody calls or sends in an email and says, oh, I have XXX question, concern, problem, um, if the answer comes back, uh, not our problem, uh, or did not our free purview or something like that, I would rate that as what's called a zero on the usefulness scale, as opposed to a response that comes back that says uh, such and such a department uh, would be qualified to handle this. I'm going to refer your reply over to them and they'll get back to you. That kind of thing. Uh, we've got to rate this, well, let's say on a five scale, would be a four or a five in terms of response. Will the service review be looking at the quality of responses too? It did. Yes. Oh, it did. I'm yeah, sorry. That's, that's part. That's what I missed. Yeah. Sorry. No, but it's that's a good question because part of it, when you're talking about service, it's the content and how quickly people get it. How quickly is that content updated when things change? So if you look at a problem as an integrated whole and then try to make sure that the solutions are addressing the whole thing. So for example, if somebody calls the front desk, and the people at the front desk take the call. Normally, they're not experts in engineering. They're not experts in building services or bylaws, Absolutely. but they would refer to someone. The idea is that the kinds of answers people at the front desk commonly ask questions can be handled quickly. One call, one stop shopping, get what you need, and you're done. Sometimes it's like peeling an onion. There's a problem that has lots of layers. Absolutely. It has to go to someone. But to the extent that other departments are involved, the idea is that I'll just say it went to bylaw, but there's a component for somebody, an engineer to be involved because there's something structural. I don't know. I'm making this up. The idea is that before the answer goes to the asker, to the resident or builder or whoever, that there's an integrated answer. One person owns it and the answers are provided as a complete whole. It's also how does information come and go? So some people call, it's quick and done. Um, they have statistics, that report has statistics in it that talks about people call about this, people call about these things, and those calls happen here. Other times people write, other people email. Um, we have to understand what proportion of which problems come through which channels, which ones are peeling the onion and involve lots of, and then how is the information um, gathered and how does it change? That's the collaboration piece that I was mentioning. Staff have to figure out, oh, this involves this and this. So it's all about making it easy for people to get an answer, a complete answer, and they know with whom they're dealing. So that's customer relations, CRM. So it's a whole, it, there's a lot of work that goes into it. We can't, a lot of it's automated sometimes. So you may have called, you may call an investment advisor about certain kinds of things and you have a couple of questions. You won't even know that you're talking to a chat bot because they're telling you what the interest rate was, what they're yeah. arguing. Yeah, so that kind of stuff happens with technology and ultimately down the road, yeah, maybe we can afford to do that. So it's a process, it'll take time. Every piece has to be analyzed, but that's the goal that staff is looking at to make sure that we're delivering the answers. And the other part, as I mentioned, I don't know if you were here, but it was the money part. The money part is you have to make, we could go out and buy a great big, huge computer program or something, but cost benefit, not yet. So the, the fiscal piece, that's what council wants to look at is say, so how much are you spending? How much are we gonna save over what period of time? And then the staff comes back and says, here's the benefit or no benefit now, but in three years it will be. Okay, good. Thanks for covering what I missed. I oh, no problem. Good. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. I have a few questions. Uh, question number one is, so we live on Doan Drive. And yes, yeah, so just like yep. across the road, yeah. And we had, so there's the townhouses that Polo built down the road across the road from us. And so typically I've seen builders have in their declaration that they have long-term rentals only, which would be a year or more, and it's like single families to be rented to only. 
Whereas Palombo, they, he has in his declaration that they could, the owner can rent a townhouse to as many people as they want, and they can, it's short term rent. So it could be students renting for four months at a time or two months or whatever it is. So the parking there is already a nightmare because they only get one parking spot, but it's like a three bedroom house or if the basement's, I think he actually finished the basement. So if the basement's finished, it could be a four bedroom or five bedroom house, depending on how many he puts downstairs. So now you can have five people living there and five cars with one parking spot. So don't drive is now full of cars all the time because the parking is a nightmare within the actual community. So how does the county look at, like when you guys, or when the county is approving these things, the builder, how, how do they, what, what do they get approved based on? We, the municipality would be responsible for saying how land is used. It would be responsible for managing um, the quality of the, the construction. So the, the building official goes out and checks the water and all those kinds. So there are rules about all of that. When it comes to rentals, I'm going, nobody on staff would be managing um, how somebody sells or purchases or leases their property. Um, that's, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't even know to whom you would speak, but I can get you an answer. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. I'll figure it out the Right person yeah, to talk no, to. I, it's, I understand that you will be managing the. This is not like you're a property manager or anything. No. But I'm trying to figure out how the builder gets permission or what to build and. Oh, like, that's done through planning. Declaration. Yeah. But how this declaration gets approved? I don't even know what the declaration is. Like I don't know anything about that. There are probably realtors in the room that have a better idea than I do. What about declarations? I have no idea about what that is or at what point that's signed or what. Who manages that so but we have the question and um i'll see if i can find out to whom you might speak or who would look at that or i mean i there might be a rule about how many houses how many people can live in a house but yeah i'll take that away if you don't mind <laughs> and then my second question was um same thing we're just trying to figure out what it seems like they're already building on. So when you're when you turn, I guess left with the lines on Crestview, they're building to the right side, and it seems like they've already sort of started digging around. But we have no idea what's going to be there. Does anybody know what they're actually? Doing? Yeah, all of those, all of that subdivision was approved a number of years ago, and different phases come along, and and when so our engineering department and building people are involved in making sure that you know certain things are done and certain things are. You know ready to do this and then yeah but the builder and the, the property owner or the builder that they've hired to build on that property are the ones that are doing that work and staff go in and check on to say permits and making sure that everything is being done according to building codes and so forth and ultimately when the whole thing is finished then the municipality will assume that property right now we have we we don't own it we don't have anything to do with it. we don't we don't do the sidewalks, we don't plow with the snow, we don't do anything there until it's assumed. And then it becomes responsibility of municipality. So those phases will continue until they're built out and assumptions can happen at different times. They don't have to do the whole thing at once, they can do pieces. Yeah, we're so, trying to figure out whether it's commercial or residential or... Yeah, so the, the, the mapping and all of those, um, you can see there are diagrams at the office that would show that oh this is commercial and this over here will be high density and this is single family and all of that is figured out there were public meetings about what kinds of development people wanted to see and then there were all kinds of processes in terms of finalizing those and then there were processes where you apply for permits so that all is there's nothing hidden about that it's all very public and documents exist to show that that will be an apartment building and that will be a single family home and that will be a store. Yeah, it's just we've just gotten a few letters that it's just changed a couple of times since we moved in. So that's why we're just trying to get what's going to Oh, as far as what kind of store? Oh yeah, that would be up to the builder too, who they they rented to. So for example, there was one property that wanted to have drive-throughs and um I think it was a 
bank. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But there were um, buildings that were going to be right at the edge of London Drive, and there would be a drive-through. And that was something that the council said even way back that we don't really want our village core to have drive-throughs. If somebody's going to have a restaurant there, then it'd be nice to be able to sit and have a coffee or a tea and visit with your friends without having fumes and cars go by you behind you and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, those there are things that get amended or changed a bit. So, but anything that has changed goes through a process too. So if they had plans to do this and then they change their mind, if it doesn't conform, it has to go back to council and they'll say, we want to amend this and change the designation to another symbol. And then they can do this kind of commercial or that kind of home or that kind of, so things can change, but it doesn't happen. It's public process. So that I'm thinking that you're close to the properties that we're going to have stores or was commercial property. Yeah, yeah. we're closer to Crestview than we are to. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, so there are things there that are still in flux and, um, I think they've appealed. Yeah, so we don't even know where we're at quite with that right now. So the person that owns the property didn't like the decision of council and they've taken it to another body for appeal. And then we'll find out whether or not this is approved or changed or yeah, we'll have to wait for decision. Yeah, so I can't even tell you what will be there. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yes, please. Yeah, the nursing home, the plans for the development of the nursing home is commended. So are, they, uh, are they senior in Chicago, or how do we find out exactly what's going to plan? So the senior home where? At, at the nursing home on Oxbow. On Oxbow. Yeah. Um, the, de the higher density development on the uh, east side. Uh, the trees that just fall cut down. Yep. And we're going to be putting in on the certain condos, but are they... The drawings were presented, what, about a month ago, I think? Where, where, the, where can we access them? Yeah. They're, they're all available. Um, you can go through the minutes, actually, and see if that property was on a, a um, council meeting. And then the package, the presentations, the report from staff, and the presentations from others, the mapping, the diagrams. Um, they showed you know, so far from the road, and it's going to have doors on the front. or Yeah, so that... You, you can see all of that. And, and will that tell me what it's designed for? Are they designed for the seniors or are they designed for the single family homes? Or the I don't think there's a risk. No, anybody could purchase one of those or, or okay. yeah. Yeah, I think the idea originally was that the very first iteration of that was going to be um, seniors' residences. Um, I don't know if you know the area, but it'd be the kind of thing that you might have seen in. Um, Park Hill, Chartwell Home is there across the road, our residences. The people, I would probably think most of them, all of them have spouses or family members in the nursing home. And then they are able to walk across for meals or, or you know, yeah. visit, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it did. Well. Yeah, you're right. It did change. That was um, the first iteration. And then there were conversations and then the property was sold and then a new plan came forward. And they've had to change things there too for access for uh, fire and turnarounds. That, like they changed the configuration of the, the, the last plan from the previous plans. Yeah. Okay. And I think you can, yeah, we can get, I can help you too with that, figure out what date that was on and let you know when it was in the package. Yeah. And then you can take a look. One other question relating to the, the environment, I guess, when the developers come in and it gets like that to cut down every tree, are they required to put any trees back at all? Are they have any green space or is that entirely up to me? Um, I guess the easiest way to say that is what you do in your yard is up to you. Yeah, that would be their property. Yeah. 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 Now, if you were to cut down trees in a um, uh, uh, Count, uh, designated forest area that is protected. So say the woods, as you're going into London, on the left-hand side, as you come toward the bridge, that forest, yeah. if you were to cut that down, you would be planting at least two trees or three trees for every one you took down. Yeah, sorry. 
back in anyway. Can't be years. <laughs> Is there anything else? How are we doing? We have a couple questions. Oh, that. yes. Okay. We'll first, take some from the first is the people had difficulty reading the slides. So, if you're okay, I'll post them. Oh, of course. So like. Okay. okay. So, um, uh, the number of people have had difficulty seeing the slides. So, they will be posted online and you will be able to see the, um, the actual slides that go along with all of the conversation. The um, next question was a question about side roads. Side roads. So the question is, will side roads be paved? Uh, we have a poultry farm on our road and the conditions are atrocious. So this would be a dirt road? Okay. There is, um, oh, I guess within the last 12 months, um, a report came to council that talked about how and in what order roads um, will be paved. And it's a function of um, where they are, how they're used, how much, what kind of traffic. Um, I have a poultry farm near me and um, the poultry farm has feed brought in regularly. So heavy truck traffic on the dirt road is um, hard on the road, but um, the, the it's a function of what kinds of traffic volumes we have and um, which, and it's safety related then too. So. Um, I, I don't know where you are. I don't know when that road is scheduled, but there is a master plan for that. And staff regularly do um, traffic counts and things like that to make sure that, that if there's a change, that that is reflected in the planning for um, the dirt roads. Just so every, and this is rough and dirty, we have about 600 kilometers of roads in our municipality. Half of them are dirt roads. Uh, one third is paved and the other two thirds is um, tar and chip. This is a rural community and um, that's kind of the way it is. And the cost of doing, I haven't got the current numbers. I did have um, a cost per kilometer, but the cost per kilometer to change over a road is not insignificant. It's quite substantial. So this is a project again, that will take time to um, change over from dirt roads to paved roads, or even tar and ship roads. More? That's it? Is there anything else? 706, that didn't take that long. If there's nothing else, then you have a cookie or, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'll be here if you wanna ask another question. And, yeah, so thank you so much for coming. Um, appreciate your time and uh, patience with new technology. It's um, good to have everyone here. The idea is that we're going to have more of these in person, I, hopefully twice a year so that we can keep you current with what's going on and give you updates on some of the things that we talked about tonight that are just in the works. And um, everyone, we have counselors here too. Everyone is happy to help you if you've got a question or you need some help with something. Um, or, or reach out to staff to um, say that's our job is make sure that you know or get answers to questions that are concerning and that your quality of life is good here. So thank you again for coming and appreciate your time tonight. Thank you.